Good evening, yeah, so good afternoon then, good evening UK Crime Book Club members and admins. Um, welcome to the author chat with the fantastic Susan Handler. Hi. Hi. So can you introduce yourself and um, just tell us a little bit about your books, please, just to get going? Yeah, I do. Um, I write murder mysteries, predominantly the Cat McKenzie series. I've written three in the series so far. Um, the A Confusion of Crows is the first one, Feather and Claw is the second, and the latest is The Body Politic, which has only been out just over a month now. Um, I write full time. I've written several um, anthologies of short stories as well. And under the name of SJ Handley, I've written a novella. Uh, which is a murder mystery, but it's set mm. in 1850s Californian gold rush. So it's a little bit different. Um, I mean, that's that's about it, really. I live in Kent uh, with my um, persevering husband and two mad cats. And mm. I enjoy things like um, being outdoors a lot. That's probably where I get most of my ideas and work in veggie patch and... Mm. It's generally chilling outside. <laughs> so we were talking a little bit before we went live about um, about Kat McKenzie. Um, where did the idea for Kat come about? She's the detective, obviously, in your your series. So what it, gave you the idea for her? Um, it came about really because I was working in a corporate environment and we were getting a lot of graduates through. And they were very clever folk, but in terms of workplace common sense, um, they were somewhat lacking. They quickly caught up, but it was actually about expectations and how an academic background where you're measured in terms of exams and scores and you get feedback in a very formal way, how people then had to adjust to being in a work environment surrounded by colleagues all with a different role all with different expectations and different abilities and how people adapted and coped and how some people seemed to adapt very well and other people didn't um, and it was that really it was just what if you took somebody who was used to an academic environment where they excelled and they were very clever and Kat McKenzie's background where she was a marine biologist and she was actually studying for a PhD and then her brother dies. Her brother was a policeman mm. and he dies in service and she comes back to the funeral and things can't be the same again. She suddenly thinks, actually, I've got to, I've got to do something that makes a difference here. So she then joins the police and all of the, the sort of learning and the, the early stages, she just you know, storms through because it's about you're, you're taught something, you respond, you, you know, you learn it by rote, you do well. Then when she's actually in the office environment, things like office politics and the mm -hmm. fact that quite often in, especially in like, I've got a history of working in the fire service and I think it's quite similar to the police force. You don't have the ability to learn every nuance on every job because they're so different. So she has to think on her feet and learn on, on her feet. And I wanted to sort of play with that in terms of a rookie environment. So quite a lot of detectives have a lot of baggage. Well, she's got none, really. That's the mm. problem. She's fresh, but she's a bit idealistic. Um, Alex, the DI, calls her a Pollyanna because she's <laughs> extremely optimistic. She thinks, oh, how hard can this be? You know, it should, it should be easy. And so finds herself getting in some difficulties because of that. But equally, she comes with fresh ideas. So she isn't jaded in the job. She doesn't think, oh, well, there's no point doing that. She thinks, actually, let's give it a go. Why don't we give it a go? And she'd probably be really irritating to have on the team <laughs> to start with because it'd be like this little yapping terrier going, well, let's just do it. Let's do it. So that's where it came from, really. And it gave me the opportunity to see how other people sort of, reflects other people's uh, attitudes off her because a female young intelligent but not necessarily worldwise um and how that would work 
she has got this really sweet innocence about her. Mm -hmm. She um, and she doesn't pick up on everything that's going on around her and different. It's hard to say too much without giving things away. Mm -hmm. But she, you right, she she doesn't. She has this perception when it comes to the police work and this gut instinct. But then when it comes to the people around her, it, it's not all as obvious to her. And you I write think, that so well. You really brought her to life in that way. I'm really pleased to hear you say that. I mean, I think she is naive um, because she wants to please. She, she went into the police force because she wanted to make a difference. And she wants to please. She wants to get it right. And so when what she says doesn't, you know, falls flat because it isn't what somebody wants to hear, perhaps, she yeah. can't understand it. She starts to think, well, hang on a minute. And why is that? And so she gets frustrated but instead of stopping and thinking well what is it i'm not doing right or what am i not reading into people she just keeps plowing on and <laughs> she does, i mean by the third book she has become a little bit more savvy um but still there's that naivety and a lot of it i think stems from her background her father was an army um a very senior position in the army was away a lot and they did travel a lot when she was um younger going from different military bases so i think that's got a lot of bearing on her attitude because she was probably always wanting to please her father because he wasn't there he was quite absent um her brother was the apple of her father's eye mm. um not academic at all very boyish very um hands-on and I think she's just desperately wanted to get some approval of him and I think that's that's sort of all the way through her core she won't probably ever be able to do that she can cope with it and deal with it better but that's who she is her dad's quite surprising in the way that he's quite quietly perceptive in the background and he surprises everybody around him with the the details that he picks up when he seems to not be paying any attention but yeah. actually he doesn't miss a trick no I think it's not the title, Dad reading the paper, who's listening to all the conversations going on around him. And Absolutely. Got in with the right comment at the right time, because he, he is, a, again, a very intelligent guy, but he is switched on. You know, he's retired from the forces. He's um, been a career armed forces person and very, very much got a lot of savvy, you know, so um she's a mixture of her mother who is ditzy as anything <laughs> and him who's very intelligent but uh, very quick with it as well he absolutely is uh, we've got oh we've had a flurry of questions so let's take some of these before i um before i take over the entire interview with all of my own um caroline hi Kaz, has asked has said she loved confusion of crows will we get more of alex's backstory now i've obviously was saying before we went live that I've just finished book three, The Body Politic. So I think um, as she reads on, she'll get to know him more, but. Yeah, I do, I love it. In fact, I've really struggled not to make it the, you know, the I Alex York series. <laughs> the more I've written about him, the more I get to really like him. Um, Would you consider doing that? Would you consider yeah, having his yeah. it's, it's a real, it's, really calling to me to do that now um <laughs> backstory yes i think you probably will um by the time we got to the body politic a lot more has come out about him and he's really grown as a person and book four which is um being planned now it continues along the same vein um in fact karen small who's a character in body politic who was actually one of the bidders in the she was in the she, she was, was yeah the character in that she will be featuring in book four as well mm -hmm. so alex will continue to have a personality develop in that story and i think probably more of the backstory will come out then because it will be more appropriate because when you've read book three you think actually alex is going through quite a lot of self-analysis so. Absolutely, yeah. Well, um, did Karen Small, who obviously is a nurse in the third book, in the body politic, 
Um, how did she feel once she saw her name and how she'd been used in the book? Obviously, again, I don't want to give too much away, but she's a terrific character. Well, from what she she contacted me and said she loved it and said, uh, I think she was quite excited when she got it because I sent her a signed copy. Um, oh, so I thought, well, it's the least I could do, really, because it was great that she actually put her hand in the pocket, in her pocket and put in for the auction in the first place. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, really good feedback from her. Fantastic. Um, we've got from um, DC Brockwell author, which is um, Duncan. Hi, Dunks. What, um, are you a planner or a pantser? And what's your process? Oh, that's a really good question because it's really developed. The Confusion of Crows, I was definitely a pantser. I mm. had a vague idea about the sort of premise, like, so what would happen if... Um, somebody accidentally did something, accidentally murdered somebody, um, <laughs> but covered it up. So there was an accidental death mm -hmm. of sorts, and they cover it up. What would happen? What would be the chain of events that would follow on? And that's where it started. And I didn't know where it was going. I had the idea for the characters, like as I said about Cass, I wanted to put this rookie detective in this environment, and it was her first murder case. That's so why I just wrote it. And I wrote it and I wrote it and I wrote it. And then I realised I don't know how to get out of it. I don't know how to get her to discover the crime. So I remember spending one Christmas, I took a week off work and I literally sat down, mapped it all out and rewrote the last third. And it was gutting, like 30,000 words backtracked to start the last end part of it again, the last third, and finished it and it was fine. And then I did Feather and Claw, which was book two, and I thought, I won't do the same mistake again. And I made exactly the same mistake again, and um, but didn't quite make such a big mistake. I stopped myself halfway through and then made sure that um, I corrected it as I went. Book three, I had a clear idea of the start, the middle-ish, and the end. But I thought, as long as I know how I was going to get out of it at the end, I then <laughs> let it roam um now i'm much more of a plotter i've just written the first of a new series so book four and i plotted it i actually did a beat sheet and um i've managed to write complete first draft and edit in six months which is the wow. first i've ever done it so i should be doing that in the future in fact i've just started <laughs> the same process with the fourth cat mckenzie and literally within a few days, I will be ready to start writing, I think. So, amazing. It worked for me. <laughs> we've got, um, well, we've got an awful lot of questions. Um, Caroline also wants to know if um, more about your historical novel. Oh, um, God, what is it called? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like putting you on the spot. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's about a, a sheriff called Jesse Cabot, and I don't know why I did it. It's set in 1849, Californian gold rush, and it's a murder. And um, I had so much fun writing it, <laughs> trying to do the whole vernacular and the scenes, and it's a very textual um, story. I tried to really focus on I've been to California on a holiday some years ago for one of my big birthdays and I just loved it I fell in love with it in um the whole thing we did a sort of mini tour and I loved going into the desert I loved going to all the parks the uh, Yosemite and it stayed with me for a long time and I just had this idea for a story because I like the idea of having none of the technology of not having the police force forensics information and having to have a character that is judging it on people and reading people and trying to figure it out from the smallest of clues mm. so that's that's where it came from really and um the, the mystery of snake pass is just back to me and <laughs> I, I just love writing it in fact i've got a follow-up to it half written but Sadly, I have to say, it makes me no money whatsoever, so it gets written when I've got a spare five minutes that I need cheering up, and I just <laughs> write another scene and play with it a bit, and so I had a lot of fun with that. 
We've got a question, another one from Kaz, um, and I'm intrigued to know the answer to this one and to see if you even know the answer yet. Will Kat and Alex find happiness either apart or together? Oh, I don't know. I honestly mm. don't know. I'd like to think they would, but I think probably not. I, um, I don't know. They, they're both very strong characters. They, they would make a good pair. They'd make a very handsome pair. I think they both um, sort of would be the Brad and Angelina, really, in terms <laughs> of matching, because they're both very good looking and very um, strong looking, if you see what I mean, in terms of facial features. So um, I'd like to think so. I don't know. It won't be probably in, next, in the next book, I shouldn't think. There might be a bit more will they, won't they going on now. Um, Kat also, uh, sorry, Kaz wants to know, um, she says, Kat is fab. Will we learn more about her marine biology background or will she need to solve a case that involves it in the future? Um, she might have to solve something that has to do with biology in the future. Um, I did actually make it marine biology because I wanted her to be a strong swimmer. Hmm. Um, oh, okay. So there will be probably something where that comes into its own later so she's on. She's going to get very wet in the sea or in a canal in the future. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, I think she was. She has been in several scenes that end up getting cut in the past. So I'm sure some of those scenes might resurrect themselves again. <laughs> but um, I think I'm not sure that there will be much about her marine biology academic experience but I think her interest in biology and her interest in the human body and biology as well animals will definitely come to the fore I mean she's she's a vegetarian she's a staunch vegetarian very much into animal welfare and um, wildlife so things like that will continue to feature. Um, Duncan Brockwell again has asked um how long does it take you to write a first draft? Now you've touched on the fact that you're about to start, you know, you've, you've planned quite well for the next one. Do you have an idea in mind for how long that might take you? Six months. Is that is that it you're giving yourself? Yeah. Um, yeah. The, I mean, the first book took me years. The second book took me a few less years. The third book took me a couple of years. Um, but, it wasn't qu quite like that bit. Actually, that's not true. That's not first draft. That's the complete thing. So I think probably the body politic, I think, took me about a year to do the first draft. Wow. I've just written the first in a new series, which is a full length novel. And that took me six months. I started after lockdown, actually. So it's slightly less than six months. So I started at lockdown and I finished it about two weeks ago. So I'm expecting wow. the next one to take a similar amount of time. How, have, how has life been for you during lockdown? Obviously, it's unusual for everybody and everyone's got a different kind of um, feel for it. Yeah, I haven't really oh. this very much. Every single author that I've asked has been like, it's been brilliant, but I don't yeah. want to offend anyone, but it's been great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a general gist. I don't see very many people. My working week is like a working week, so... I start after breakfast, I work through to lunch, I stop and have lunch and I read a book, able, not a book, but I read for about an hour over lunch. Then I'm back at my desk and I work through till dinner time. I say not work orientated, but what I have found, which I really loved, is how quiet the roads have been. So if I get a problem with plotting, first thing I do is get my shoes on and I go for a walk. And I find I can solve pretty much any plot hole with a walk just every single time and normally you're having to keep your wits about you because I live rural in a rural area but it's quite country lane so cars come flying around yeah um, and I've not had that problem at all I mean the biggest problem I had at the start of lockdown was all the people that were out walking and I was thinking <laughs> what are you doing out here there's you know normally I don't see a soul and I, I'd be having to Cross the right you know, cross the lane to avoid people. So um, that's been the nicest thing, actually, is just the lack of traffic. So. Yeah, I can imagine it would be. Mm. Um, Cass has also commented maybe Alex could have a spin off novella. Ooh, that's a good idea. Mm. That'd be quite nice, actually, yeah. 
Um, sorry, go on. No, I was just saying I hadn't thought of that, but that's a good idea. Yeah, um, a perfect story for that. I might do that. Yeah. <laughs> She's also said that Kat's parents come across as a little disappointed with her. Um, does she build a better relationship over the series? Now, her mum's quite formidable, shall we say. Mm. Well, her mum adores her father. Her mum hangs on everything her father says. Mm. And her father is a very traditional man. And he would like, in fact, they'd both like nothing more than to see Kat married, with children, forgetting her career. And that's what they would love her to do. For them and for her father in particular, they wanted her brother to be, you know, the strong one in the police force, rising through the ranks. Mm. So it's more a case that they aren't meeting, that she isn't meeting their norms, their expectations, if you like, from the point of view of bringing them grandchildren. And particularly now her brother Pete's dead, um, they're worried that they're not going to get any grandchildren. Yeah, they... Um quite when you read about them it's quite it her mum wants her to be more feminine and to you know dress prettier mm. i would you know it'd be a, a word maybe uh, she's quite old-fashioned but they yeah. do work yeah. really well together as a couple and they do really seem supportive of each other so it is nice mm. but i suppose that's like all families you got, you're going to have bits that work really well and bits that drive each other mad yeah so you write she, that beautifully. Well, she she was the baby, I think, and that's the other thing, you know. So her brother had already um, set a path, if you like. Mm. And so she went off to university and then went and studied um, marine biology in the Maldives. They were able to focus on her brother, and I think her brother dying, mm. you know, very suddenly in action, has cause them possibly possibly to resent her for still being there and not him yeah it doesn't come across in a harsh way but that mm. does definitely come across mm. but i think um, i would like to think at the end of the body politic there is a softening yeah i'd agree with that yeah mm. definitely a softening towards her choices and if if nothing else getting used to it you know she she is strong yeah she is naive but she is very strong and she does know her own mind yeah so yeah hopefully well we'll be able to see with book four how that develops can't wait to read book four we've got um <laughs> duncan brockwell um earlier on when he, he asked whether you were um, a planner or a panther he actually wrote panther which he's just realized but i didn't read that out but because he's commented on that i can chuckle at that now um Kaz has asked is the research a lot different for a historical novel to a crime novel i mean how much research do you have to do i found it the um, same, actually because i research um specifics so and I think in doing, so I'll have something I'm thinking about doing and then I'll research, is it possible? Does it fit with the period? Is it um, feasible? And then in reading on that topic, I will pick up so much more about it. So I might be reading about, I don't know, what sort of soap they used in 1850 California um, mm. in those sorts of conditions. And you'll find an article about the soap, but it'll also talk about women's clothes and it'll also talk about what they might have eaten. And so you start to pick this, build this picture up of that environment at that time as a consequence of probably trying to find out one thing. And that's mm -hmm. what I tend to do. And I, I'll write the first draft um, and I won't tend to do very much research up front. I did for the first book, I did a lot of research um, up front. And I found I didn't use very much of it at all. Mm -hmm. Actually, I probably spent quite a few weeks delving quite deeply into things that I could have spent my time writing. And now I find that I'll write the first draft. And if there's something I need to research, I might not even research it as I do it. I'll flag it up and then I'll research it in the evenings. So rather mm -hmm. than disturb the flow of writing, I'll make a list of things that need to be researched. And then I'll do that in the evenings. 
have have you found anything in the research that you have done that surprised you whether you've you know used it in your books or not yeah it was all sorts of funny facts when you're in, like, looking into murder there's some really bizarre things that um you just come across in fact i wrote one i read something i can't think how i came across it now but it ended up being a short story i wrote about the saltash sea and mm. there was something i can't remember the number now might be a hundred feet have been discovered just individual feet <laughs> Just, just in the Saltash Sea, which goes <laughs> off Vancouver Island. And oh, I've actually heard about this. Well, they've been researching, <laughs> looking into donkey shares. Mm. You know, there must be some fetishist serial killer that chops people's feet off. And actually, what they now think it is is that it's the advent of trainers. The training shoes are quite, um, the soles are quite cushioned and float. So, well, the bodies which they think are predominantly suicides, like bridge jumps, mm. as they decompose and the um, different parts of their limbs come apart, then the feet dislocate, if you like, separate, but the foot stays in the tied trainer and it floats. And that's why it doesn't decompose and that's why they mm. find them bobbing around on the beach. And, well, it's things like that that you can recall. Quite a shock for an early morning jogger. <laughs> yeah, especially when I think some of them were coming up in multiples, but different trainers. Do you think that's a bit weird? <laughs> in fact, oh, yeah, yeah. I did. I did write one of my short stories was about um, a serial killer with a fetish about feet, based on that <laughs> act. Is that in one of your crime bites? Yeah, I think that's Crime Bites Volume Two. I think. Yeah. So we need to. Uh, we'll pop some links in for people at the end. So yeah. They can have a look at your own, um, the crime bites, the the two. So do you want to tell, explain to people what the crime bites are for anyone who's not seen them? Yeah, they're just two collections of short stories, and they were whilst I was writing the last two, probably Feather and Claw actually. I mm. wanted to play with different writing styles. I didn't want to not write the novel. I'd got the clear idea, I knew what I wanted to do. So I thought if I write lots of short stories, I can try lots of different styles. So I started to write typically about 1,200, 1,300 words. And then I'd write a slightly longer one, 4,000 words, slightly longer again, 6,000 words. And then, and I, I so when the UK Crime Book Club has one of those shorts, like the scary shorts or the spring shorts, I'll put something in for one of those. But I found I ended up with quite a lot of them because I was writing mm. a fortnight. So in the end, I just thought, well, I'll put them all out there. And I have parceled them up almost as a menu. So there are some that are very short and you know, as a starter. And then mm. there's a couple or three that are longer, that are like the meaty mains. And then at the end of the, the collection, there are some that are like dessert, so they're more cosy perhaps, or mm -hmm. a bit more humorous. So they're lighter rather than some of the uh, the opening ones, which are a bit more serious perhaps, or a bit more contemporary. Mm -hmm. So it was a good way to just compile the different efforts of my um practices if you like but they're all different some are cozy some are quite dark and um, some are humorous and um, just quite quick reads for whenever well, you've got five minutes it's always probably like 15 minutes to spare so mm -hmm. fun. well while you've mentioned them we'll give will templeton who organizes our short stories and as you say we've had halloween and we've had scary mm -hmm. shorts and generally crime based but mm -hmm. some of them have been like Kath Middleton wrote one that was a bit more lighthearted as well. So um, yeah, we'll give Will a shout out and thank him because he yes. does run about four a year, and they are great fun. Yeah, definitely. Well, I've always I've always done them, and um, I must say a big thank you to Will actually because the last one I was a bit late in saying I was going to do it because I wasn't sure I'd gonna. So I, I was writing this new book, and I was on a bit of a deadline. I thought oh, I haven't got time, and then I thought oh no, I've got an idea. I can't not let an idea go. So I contacted him sort of after the close down, said, can you sneak me in? And he did. <laughs> so thank you, Will. Yes, it's lovely. 
Yeah. He's very, very tolerant, yeah. is William. <laughs> Puts up with a lot from the admins. <laughs> and general, yeah, a lot of general ribbing, bless him. <laughs> and we've got some more questions. Um, Caroline Maston has asked, ever tempted to use your fire service background and have an awesome plot? Oh yeah! Oh, we're giving something away there. It might not be arson, but there will, there will definitely be one with a fire element in it. Definitely, mm. might not be. Won't be the next one. Probably won't be the one after that. But it might be the one after that. Yeah. Um, how hard was it to begin as an author, and what made you decide to start writing? Oh. Um, well, it wasn't, it depends what you mean by author, I suppose. In terms of starting writing, I used to love English at school. Mm -hmm. I didn't do particularly well because I never liked the books that the teacher was um, getting us to read. I suppose I was quite contrary. I was very contrary. Mm -hmm. I wanted to read the things I wanted to read, and not what was on the syllabus. Mm -hmm. um, but I did really enjoy reading. Um, my mum was a very avid reader, particularly crime fiction. And so I, sort of got hooked on crime fiction at a very early age and I was at university studying chemistry and my mum had finally got the complete collection of Agatha Christie. Mm. Well, I'd been buying her one for a birthday and for Christmas for quite a few years and I was thinking well I don't want to buy her now. Mm. So I was in my second year at university and I thought naively I'll write one, I'll write one in the style of Agatha Christie over the summer. I had no idea, but I, I bought an Olivetti and I used to sit clunk, clunk, clunking on this Olivetti trying to knock out an Agatha Christie, short, uh, an Agatha Christie novel. And I was trying to use all the vernacular and, and I wrote it and I did actually complete the novel and it was terrible. <laughs> it was absolutely awful. And she did get it and she did see it and she was very kind. And then that was it for quite a few years until probably. 20 years ago maybe not quite 20 years ago and I was in a relatively stressful job and I felt I needed a hobby but it was winter and didn't know what else to do so I thought well, I'll start writing I was like, and at the time I was just doing an evening a week just something to keep me amused and then it grew to two evenings a week and then it was three evenings a week and then it was four evenings a week mm -hmm. and then I got a first draft of a novel so I thought, well, this is okay. And uh, then I carried on working it. It wasn't particularly, it, it turned out to be a confusion of crows in the end, mm -hmm. but it took me quite a few years of knocking it into shape. Um, and then, unfortunately, I got an even better job in theory, higher paid job, definitely, but it was a lot more hours. I went from a six mile commute to a hundred mile commute. I was quite often working 50, 60 hour weeks and writing definitely um, took a dive. So for seven years, I didn't write anything. Mm. And then uh, circumstances changed. I picked the Confusion of Crows back up, but I'd already then got an idea of another book. So I started to write Feather and Claw. And then I wrote Body Politics. So it sort mm. of just snowballed. Like, it was more the fact that I, I wrote because I enjoyed writing mm. first. And then when I realised, actually, I'd at one point I thought I've got two completed novels and I'd, I'd done nothing with them and I was halfway through a third. Mm. I thought I probably should do something with these. Mm. So then that's when I decided to publish them and obviously Kindle was, Amazon was doing quite a lot in terms of self-publishing. So I thought oh, I'll just stick them out now and see see what happens. That's, that's it really. Um, Duncan Brockwell has said, if it's not rude to ask, do you have an agent and how many rejections did you receive prior to, be, prior to being accepted if you do have an agent? No, no, no agent. Um, probably when I finished A Confusion of Crows, one of the earlier drafts, mm -hmm. there was a lot of drafts, I did <laughs> send it to some agents and I got really good feedback. I got handwritten feedback mm. from about four different agents. I probably only sent it to maybe a dozen. Mm. Um, and they would typically, they liked the style of writing, they thought it was okay, but they didn't think the story was gripping enough. So I then took that on board and 
made some changes to the story. But then, as I said, life sort of intervened and mm. I ended up not writing for some years. So then by the time I came back to writing, I decided to try self-publishing rather than go through the published route, mainly because I'd got sort of a little bit of, uh, I'd got two completed stories and I was halfway through a third. I just wanted to get something out there, really. Yeah, and I'm really glad you did because I have to disagree with whoever the agents were um, because, as you know, we were talking a bit before we um, went live and I was gripped straight away. So I like, yeah, don't know what the problem was. <laughs> Um, Caroline has asked, do you have a title plan? The first two are nature themed, was that intentional? I love your titles and that was something that me and Kaz both wanted to know. Right, well, thank Kath Middleton for those, not, not the actual titles, but um, there's a bit of a story in that I finished both A Confusion of Crows and Feather and Claw and um, I was starting on self-publishing and I was looking for an editor and I was looking at a lot of self-published books, I was reading a lot of self-published books and I read one by Andy Barrett and I thought this is really well written and it's really well edited so I emailed him and said would you mind telling me who your editor is, I love your book and I think it's really well done and he said oh a really good friend of mine happens to read it first and knock it into shape and he gave me Kat's name. He contacted Kath and she got in touch and she very kindly read through A Confusion of Crows and at the time it was called Blood Ties and she said I really like it and here are some comments on it she says but the title is just really mundane <laughs> she might be more polite than that but reading between the lines that's what she said she said come up with something different and come up with something that's more striking and um, I just tried to free think it a bit more and I thought actually one of the things in the plot is Cat becomes almost inundated with who it could be there are more suspects than um you could shake a stick at really and it was almost like you know when you and a lot of them were squawking crows a lot of them were very um look at me look at me and I just had this image of her with a shotgun and I was thinking well which one do I shoot which one and that's mm. where the idea came from um, and then Feather and Claw, I liked the, there are birds in, in the, the book, there's um, a, a, quite a cruel and illegal trade called, I don't know how you pronounce it, but Ambipelia, which is in the, the Greek and some Mediterranean countries where they pickle songbirds. And that is, that features mm. in the book. But also there are characters that have a soft and a hard side and one of the things behind the, the, the themes behind the book really is how when you're on holiday you can't often take people at face value so what you see isn't necessarily what you get and behind a soft exterior could be quite a hard um, interior and it was that feather and claw type of um, juxtaposition so that's where that title came from and um, I was going to do it with the body politic I was thinking around something around a parliament of owls, um, but for some reason I just got the body politic in my head, um, and it sort of stuck. But and I was really wondering now whether I should have done a parliament of owls. But anyhow, <laughs> <laughs> well, we do. Um, we know that Kath Middleton, who is one of the admins, um every author that I speak to just so many of say how generous with the time she is yeah, and with yeah. she's fantastic and she is very supportive and very generous and a terrific author herself yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. All, so, all those things and how, she must have a TARDIS because I don't know how she creates the time that she does because she's just <laughs> amazing maybe she's a secret coffee addict Ah, that would be it. Maybe, yeah. I've no idea. It's all that garden and all that pottering about. She must be standing in the um, in the bags of the compost herself. <laughs> Just <laughs> energised. <Yeah. laughs> um, I had a question that I love to ask our authors about any memorable moments that you have. 
Now you fit a lot into um, a short period of time, although it's you've been writing for quite a while. Mm. You, you fit a lot in, so there's there's loads. Mm. I think um, every little achievement is a memorable moment. Actually, um, there's been a lot of glasses of fizz drunk in this house for memorable <laughs> moments. You know, pushing the button on the first book on the Kindle. Um, things like um, I do my own cover art. So wow. that's that's probably been a memorable moment in actually getting covers that I'm happy with um, and getting the whole publishing thing. Because I am probably, my husband will say, I'm the most useless person at technology. <laughs> you know, and he's, he's an IT expert and he just stands there huffing and puffing and rolling his eyes and he watches me. <laughs> it's painful for him to watch me. And yet, you know, He's had nothing to do with any of the publication stuff and putting things on Kindle and doing all the editing and the formatting. So I think that's been quite a big celebration for me. Um, mm. And then especially getting the paperback, that is a bit of a thrill. It's, it's not so much holding the paperback, it's when you flick through the pages and you see it's like proper pages, proper words, yeah. proper paper, and you zoom in and read a paragraph and think, it's not bad, that's okay. Mm. And it looks like a proper book. That's that's a very special moment. That must feel quite special. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So do you celebrate each time you publish? Do you have a glass of fizz or do you go out for a meal or you no, know, normally just a glass of fizz, or maybe two. Um it's it's normally just me and my husband downstairs having well, open a bottle of Prosecco or you know, Carver and have a few nibbles and a glass of fizz sitting in the garden and just breathing out, you know, like, oh, that's another one. I find the lead up to getting it on Kindle stressful, not because it's difficult, but because you want to get it right. The last thing you want to do is get anything out there with a mistake. And the process is quite easy for seeing previews. But what will happen is I'll look through a preview and I will literally look through every say, every page of it. And then something will niggle me and I think, oh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. And that pressing the button and just launching it is quite a relief to get that done. So I'm not sure about going out for a meal, but yeah, just to spend probably 20 minutes, half an hour of just relaxing and thinking that's, that's done now. I haven't got to worry about it. That's good. We've got um, a comment, and I'm really, really pleased to see that she's here. Um, hi from Nurse Small in Stormy Wales. <laughs> hello. <laughs> oh, hello. Oh, I'm so excited that she's come to see you. That's lovely. She's <laughs> missed it when we just talked about her character. She has, but you did mention that there might be um, a bit more in book four. Yes, there definitely will be. <laughs> yeah. That's really made me smile. <laughs> um, when it comes to writing, I know you're saying you do some research when it's necessary, but when it comes to investigating the murder, how do you decide what part of the plot to put where without me giving anything away? How do you know how to, you know, the weaving things in and varying the pace and... Um, we have a rough outline of how that's going to work. I do um, a storyboard at the start of the process now. I didn't originally, but I do now. And I will have clues written in around the... Uh, when I say storyboard, it's not like um, a screenwriting one. I literally have got a whiteboard um, on an easel in, in this room with... Um, and I'll put the characters in with lines showing how they're attached. Mm. I'll then put um, comments in about how they interact. And then around the edge, I will actually have clues to do with the murder and who they relate to. And I can then see how they would evolve. So I'll put them in on an outline first. And quite often I'll write the first draft and then mm. I'll read it through and I'll think, oh no, that's, that's too early. It's gonna give the game away. Or I think, oh, no, that's too late. That's not fair on the reader because the detective's bound to come across that or ask that question. What I hate when I read crime fiction is when you have a detective 
and there's something obvious that you think, they'd ask that, they'd ask that. And you scream mm. at the book thinking, why don't you just ask them this? And then mm. they ask it, okay, you don't know, they'd have asked it earlier. They'd have asked it earlier. So I try not to cheat the reader. I try to let things emerge in a way that I think is natural. So there will be times when I have to switch chapters around and I might have to, they'll interview somebody sooner than they were going to or I'll make them somebody unavailable. If some um, evidence comes out from a conversation with somebody and it's too soon, I think the it's going to give the game, give something away too soon. Um, mm. That person might be on holiday, <laughs> something mm. like that. So it's quite carefully thought out. So you're not averse to moving scenes around to make no. it fit. Because is the point, isn't it? If you know it wouldn't work yeah. where it is, then a bit of a reshuffle. It's, it's not done without a lot of groaning. Because <laughs> you can't just move a chapter. Because all these threads that link to it, and it ends up getting in a mess. You have to do it really mm -hmm. carefully, and then unpick everything, and then resew everything back up again. So it's all pulled back together again tightly. Yeah, we have all seen that. We've all seen that thing where we think you've moved most of that, not in your book, <laughs> but where people have moved most of something, but then there's something that's been left. Yeah. And you just know it doesn't quite work. Mm. What, um, what made you choose crime? Or did everything just come to you? And I know um, you said you, your mum read a lot of crime. Was that an influence for you? Yeah. I mean, my mum was a very avid reader of all genres, um, but crime particularly. And very wide. She'd read contemporary crime. She liked a lot of uh, classic crime. So, Nagaya Marsh, Agatha Christie, um, Georges Simenon. So she, she'd read a whole range of crimes. So I would then read what she read. So I basically read her collection. Um, although <laughs> there, there were some that she probably didn't want me to read and discovered like, <laughs> oh, Robin isn't something a teenager should read, she discovered. <laughs> um, but So I read everything that she read, all of her cast-offs. So I got very much into the classics and then more contemporary American stuff. So like the Michael Connellys and Patricia Cornwell. Mm -hmm. um, so I read, and at university I had loads of time. So, you know, you can, I used to go to the, the library and bring back sort of eight novels at a time, as much as I could carry, and would get through them everything quickly. Um, so when I started to write, I didn't actually start writing crime. I started to write um, rom-com because the Bridget Jones was out. Um, mm. I like Nick Hornby. Oh yeah. But I was I was reading quite a lot of um, Mike Gale, lots of comedy, and I quite liked the light, quick pace type of read of it. And it, as I said, it was. A hobby it was just something to de-stress mm. and then I actually found it really wasn't very funny <laughs> so <laughs> I'd read it back I'd, I'd, I'd be laughing while I was writing it and then I'd read it back and I think oh, no and mm. the red pen was just coming out more and more but I really wanted to continue to write um, and I thought and I think I probably read uh, a book on it you know probably Stephen King on writing or something like that that said write what you know and I thought I know crime I've read all types of different crime stories I love watching crime I, lo I mean my husband despairs because we've got old Poirot and Miss Marples and it doesn't matter who plays it I've just got loads on our Sky Plus channel and if ever I'm feeling a bit I haven't got enough to do or I just I, I get migraines I've got a migraine mm -hmm on the settee, close my eyes and listen to an old marple and it's just um, comfy pair of slippers really. So I love watching crime, I love the old Columbos, it was just easy compared to doing rom-com when you're not funny. <laughs> God, mine is uh, Murder She Wrote, absolutely oh. love Jessica Fletcher, I think she's yeah. fantastic. Like, wouldn't want to live anywhere near the woman. No. But, um, don't want to visit anywhere she's gone. But no. I'm quite happy to, yeah, I'm the same with migraines. Just, yeah, sit in a dark room and listen. Yeah, yeah. Well, I used to want to be Quincy. Mm. 
Oh, I, my dream was to be Quincy when I was younger. <laughs> I actually found that um, I had a, a, a top that I loved, just kind of like a, a light blue top, you know, with like a ribbon around the neck. And um, I was watching an episode of Murder, She Wrote, one day, and I thought, oh, my word, I'm dressing like a... That's where <laughs> it came from. So I stopped that. I stopped that quite quickly. <laughs> Um, we've got a comment saying hello from South Africa. I'm not sure who that is, but Ooh. hello. It's just yeah. come up with, um, Facebook user. <laughs> and Nurse uh, Paul was busy doing her roots. <laughs> so she missed the big <laughs> We don't mention roots. Mine are um, appalling. Lockdown has not been favourable in terms of... actually years. where mine are. Ah, there's somewhere down here by this point. <laughs> Part of the year off, I just wasn't even worrying, but never mind. Um, we've got um, glad to be making a reappearance in another cat book. Want to get closer to Di York? Question mark. Question mark. Oh. It is a bit of a hunt, so I'm not surprised. Um, I always think Will Carling. I think could make a good Di York. But, um, yes, there might be a little bit of getting closer. Certainly, in terms of. Um, as far as cat can see, that's that's the thing. It's cat's not happy about it. In a few minutes, I am going to ask you to show your um, show your covers if you have them. Yes. Yeah. Um, what are you? Uh, what have you been reading at the moment? You said you like to read at lunchtime. Are you reading crime at the moment, or are you reading something different? Um, I finished the six by Luca Vest yesterday. Oh, okay. Um, that was quite different. And because you don't that often get something that first person. So I enjoyed looking at it from that perspective. And then I started uh, Where the Cool Dads Sing by, is it Naomi? Oh, I've got it written down somewhere. Oh, no, Delia Owens. Um, I'm loving it. I'm absolutely loving it. Um, because it's set in 1950s, 1960s. North Carolina mm -hmm. and you, I mean the, the writing is fantastic it really transports you there really good so yeah loving that. Mm. Do you want to show off your covers so um, our members who are watching can have a little look? Right I'm embarrassed to confess these are my pre-sale covers so you can see which why it's got the hideous line across there um Hang on. There you go. So that, confusion of crows. Mm -hmm. um, it's always slightly different when you don't pay back to on the Kindle, so it takes it's a lot of fiddling around, I found. That was the first one. Feather and claw. Mm -hmm. uh, there you go. Is the second one. Which um oh, I love this image. I love the fact that you can get so many images um free on the internet. Mm -hmm. And but even if you don't, the first one for a confusion of crows wasn't that one. It had a mask on it, and I can't. It, it was somebody selling the masks, and I contacted her and said, "Oh, could I use the image?" She said, "Yeah, sure. Don't worry about it." Oh. So very good. And then this is the latest one. Um, this features like CCTV because one of the things through the throughout the book really is just how much we are scrutinised. Um, there are CCTV cameras on the street, in pubs, um, in some cases in people's houses. And yet, with all that scrutiny, people can still get away with so much, almost mm. into sight. And I thought that was quite an interesting play for, for today, really, in terms of the, the culture that we live in today. Um, means that most of us are very law abiding because you're constantly being watched. But then there are some people who either don't care or are even more clever at burying it even deeper. So, yeah, I mean, that's something that um, you touch on in, and again, I don't want to give anything away, so I'm not going to be too specific. But how hard is it to write um, murder scenes or more sinister things in? Um, in the the detail i mean it's not overly graphic the no. way you describe some things and i for one was very grateful of that i've read quite a few graphic things lately and i needed something that was just a little bit no. had the edge 
enough it wasn't quite as dark and you balanced that beautifully so how is it for you writing that kind of scene um i find i prefer writing that kind of scene the way i write it which is to allude to a lot rather than um yeah to illustrate it because that's the type of scene i would like to read um i always remember there's a Wilbur Smith book that starts with elephants being blown up and it's on landmine oh, and it's absolutely horrific and I used to love Wilbur Smith and I read the book and it was a great book but I almost didn't make it through those first chapters and yeah. it absolutely um, tore me to shreds. I, was, I remember sobbing reading it and uh, I find that that I can, I can understand why he did it, and I think in terms of the graphicness, the graphic nature of that, it was probably necessary to make people aware mm -hmm. of what was going on. But I try yeah. to be a little bit more focused on the after effects of what that sort of thing does, what what the crime does, and what it's what, it, what the ramifications are, rather than focus mm -hmm. too much on that scene. Um, and I think it's mainly because I don't want to put people off uh, because the, you, you've got to have some gritty scenes in there because people don't necessarily, I mean, some people commit murder for stealing your watch, but on the whole, people need some significant rationale to act in a certain way. So you've got to, mm. you've got to refer to it, but whether or not you do it graphically, um, is up to you as an author and I don't particularly like to read it that graphically I and mean, I, I do read graphic novels and I remember reading American Psycho in fact actually that I didn't find too bad because it was almost too far the other way yeah it, it almost became unemotional but if you've got scenes where there's quite an emotional buy-in then to have the graphic nature on that as well, I think might just be too much. And so I t try and to say, keep it just to that illusion of what's going on rather than any specifics. People's, yeah. people's imagination will probably paint a much clearer picture than any of the words I could put on the page, I think. Well, funnily enough, and it wasn't one of the darker scenes, but um, I put a post in the group a few days ago that I'd actually dreamt about being in your book. Yes. So <laughs> it, it was literally um, the, the scene um, at the beginning, and I was nothing to do with the murder, and I wasn't murdered in my dream, but that was how vivid the description was, that I'd literally dreamt that I was in that room and looking around, so nothing particularly happened. But it was really strange for me because I don't think that's ever happened before. So you've got kind of a lightness of touch that really does make you feel like you've experienced it, which is quite oh. special in itself. That's so nice to hear. <laughs> um, we are coming up to eight o'clock now. That has been a really quick hour. Yeah. It's completely disappeared. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us? Well, I can see somebody wants to see the whiteboard. Oh yeah, is that yeah? That's Kazi's kind well, of thing. I, can show it, but I don't think there might be. Hang on. Right. And I'm right. Yeah, with Caroline Maston. Ah, okay. It's literally. I cleaned it this morning. I've got the, the cloth there from having wiped off the previous novel. It mm. builds all the way through as I write it, and I, I literally I'd finished the the novel I've just finished now and I've done one edit on it and I thought I can wipe the board but I, I do take a photo, photograph of it first and then I write up the detail in a book as well just to make sure I've got it and then I've been, down, been for a walk at lunchtime come back and I've started to populate it with the Cat McKenzie book four storyline um, <laughs> so lucky for any um, fans there's we, it was quite blurry so yes <laughs> no, no peaks we didn't get to find out anything but um there's no names on it yet either. So. <laughs> so have you got most of book four? I know you said you've got a, a lot of details. Do you know exactly where you're going to jump in? Do you jump in at the beginning and work your way through? Or is, is the less of a formal order? Um, I don't know where I'm going with book four. I don't know where I'm going to start, actually. No, I know, I know all the backstory. Mm -hmm. So I know who's done it, why they've done it. Um, 
how they're going to try and get away with doing it. I don't know quite the detail of how they've done it exactly. I don't know how they're going to discover it yet. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where it's going to start. So, but probably by, what day are we today, Wednesday? I would imagine by Friday, I should know most of those things. Wow, two days. Okay, that's fast. <laughs> well, I don't let myself think about it until I put the previous one to bed. I start thinking about themes and people and their lives. Uh, I don't think about the detail of the plot because I don't, I don't want that dragging my mind out of what I'm working on. Yeah, I can understand that. We do have authors who do two or three things at once, and I don't think I could do that. I can do short stories, but not novels, I think. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I actually it was Wednesday. I have no clue what day I'm on at the moment. <laughs> um, and I can't wait to read book four. So hopefully you'll come back when you've got um, a publication date and we can have a chat again. Brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you to all of the members and admins as well. Thank you. It's a lot, lot of fun. I've enjoyed myself. <laughs>